Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the front row. My name is Jamie Williamson, and I'll be the host today, moderating our discussion. Uh, today, we have a tag team effort from two of our stars working in the area of digital medicine. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Katie Bakamotis, and she is the director of uh, Scripps's trans the SRTI uh, uh, Digital Trial Center. And I'm also pleased to introduce Julia Moore Vogel, who's the director of the Participant Center at All of Us. Uh, so both of these are leading investigators at Scripps Research Translational Institute, and that's led by Dr. Eric Topol. And they're applying all kinds of innovative data gathering methods and using uh, technology and wearable devices to really make a major impact on human health and trying to understand how to uh, really improve the way we do medicine using some of the remarkable tools that are widely available uh, in, in, our, in our culture at this point. Uh, so there's gonna be a tag team effort today. And uh, I, I will, uh, Katie will start off and they will kind of go back and forth uh, having a discussion. So at, at the very end, I'll come back on and uh, we'll have a, a, a Q and A. So we'll basically, uh, uh, you know, any, anytime during this, uh, this seminar, you can type your questions into the Q and A and I'll be monitoring and I'll come back and then I'll try to lead a discussion to, to sort of ca capture more uh, of your interest in, in this really interesting topic. Uh, so, uh, and again, one thing that I just need to remind everyone is that Scripps Research is that. It's a research institute. We are not uh, uh, providing medical care, so we can't provide anyone with uh, specific medical advice, but we encourage you to uh, listen to the science and think about what it means for you and ask us questions. So we're going to engage in a dialogue, and I will come back. So, uh, what, uh, Katie, why don't you take it away? Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Jamie, for the introduction. And Julie and I are thrilled to be here with you, so many of you uh, close to the end of the year, and present our work um, from our entire team to the Front Row Lecture Series. So this is great for us. We are, we've got a pretty audacious goal of transforming the way that we do biomedical research. So um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about how we're um, trying to enable anyone anywhere to contribute to and benefit from biomedical research. So I'll start um, with, with a little flashback. Uh, 2013, uh, as uh, Jamie mentioned, we work under Dr. Eric Topol at the Scripps Research Translational Institute. That's where uh, the, the Scripps Research Digital Trial Center sits. Um, and back in 2013, uh, Dr. Topol visited Stephen Colbert and made a pretty bold claim. He said that we are going to be able to change the way uh, we do medicine from smartphones and, and sensors. So he, he made a claim saying that, you know, what's going to be different going forward is that your smartphone is going to be a conduit of data and information about your health, about your medical essence like you've never had before. So since that time and, you know, over the past decade, um, if you go to the next slide, Julia, we, we've seen this huge explosion in digital health technologies. So I don't know if any of you remember, you know, back when, when these wearables and sensors just started, you know, the, the first original Fitbit kind of looked like a, I don't know, a fancy pedometer um, that could track uh, sleep activity, resting heart rate. Some of the early, early smartphones, you know, uh, looked uh, pretty um, basic if you compare to what we have now. So now what we've seen over the last several years is an explosion. Everything from ECGs on your wrist, you can get continuous glucose monitors in the home. Um, if you were to check out my Fitbit right now, you would probably see my heart rate is a little bit, you know, elevated. They could tell you I'm a little bit stressed out because I'm talking right now. They have things like mindfulness, how well you sleep, um, your ring knows you better than you do. Um, so these are the, the types of things that are available now that we've seen advances really within the space that we've been working in over the last decade that have really been able to transform the way we think about medicine, the way we think about health. Um, it's catching up. A lot of these uh, companies and organizations are direct to consumer. It's starting in the consumer space, but really, as we've seen with um, different organizations and, and policymakers, 
um, if we go to the next slide, there's a lot of work now kind of playing catch up a little bit. So I want to highlight one uh, from the Digital Medicine Society, DIME, that, that Scripps works with, really looking at how do we start to identify standards. So there's tons of organizations coming together, taking a look at all of these biomarkers that now we can get in the home, on your wrist, on a sensor, on a wearable patch, on other uh, sensors that you have in your home, on your smartwatch. How do we take this, figure out what is clinically relevant, how do we identify those standards and other guidelines uh, for digital biomarkers? So really lots of advancements, both on the technology front and also on the policy and science front. And as we've seen all of this progress, we also have new capabilities that have transformed the way we can conduct clinical research. So for those of you uh, who have been involved in clinical research in the past, mostly been around academic medical centers, you might get in-person recruitment from a study coordinator, you might be referred by your clinician. Typically, these are done in the larger centers in certain areas of the country. What digital health technologies does is it enables us to think outside of the box, outside of the traditional academic medical center. So back in 2015, we broke ground with one of the first direct to participant uh, trials. This was in partnership with some of our great collaborators over at Janssen Pharmaceuticals, just across the street from us, and Aetna. And we conducted one of the first sightless clinical trials. And that meant everything was done remotely and completely direct to participant. So that means everything from emailing out and doing direct mail out to folks to get them enrolled, bringing them to a website where they went through kind of an early version of an electronic uh, consent process. They were sent out a Zeo patch um, to see if we can detect AFib, um, a condition that gives you high risk for stroke on a high risk population. Um, this was one of the first, it was, it was incredibly successful. Um, we were able to show that. And importantly, we did it on a population where I think the average age was somewhere in the mid seventies. So this one uh, stops near and dear to my heart uh, because this is where I was introduced uh, to the Scripps research team. So if you go to the next slide, um, I'll, I'll give you a hint uh, where I came from. So back in 2016, I was brought on. Um, I had been doing research, but research of a completely different uh, type. So I'm an I'm a applied behavioral scientist by trade. So I was working at places like Walt Disney um, doing large scale consumer research studies and, um, and, and several other companies, but really in the behavioral science space. So I was looking at, you know, how do we understand what motivates consumers, what motivates people to do the things that, that we want them to do. Um, and I was lucky enough to um, be introduced to Dr. Eric Topol, Dr. Steve Steinhubel. And, and Dr. Steinhubel, you know, lucky for me, I think was, was very interested in behavioral economics, behavioral science, and also was a big fan of Disney. And so when they were struggling a little bit at the early stages of InStops, um, in terms of just on the recruitment side, the technology was there, all the infrastructure was there, but how do we reach people? How do we get people to be interested in this study? Um, Steve reached out to me and he said, you know, can you help us with this? Um, and I was pretty honest. I said, you know what? I don't really um, have any clue what motivates somebody to, to get involved in clinical research, but we certainly have methods um, like A-B testing and different things where we can um, uncover underlying motivations figure out what barriers are there and really start to learn how to how to reach out to people. So I was brought on uh, to that. That was just my first little dipping my toe in the water. And it, it started my quest of really wanting to bring the magic, if you will, to uh, the participant experience as a researcher. How do we start to understand what the drivers are? How do we make this interesting to people? How do we return information back in a way that's valuable? How do we transform all of this research into clinical care eventually? So that was my start of getting involved with this amazing growing group at the Scripps Digital Trials Center. And we were really able to accelerate some of our work um, you know, that started with MSTOPS uh, with um, our, our early experiences with the All of Us Research Program. So around the same time that we were finishing up the MSTOPS program, um, the Precision Medicine Initiative was announced, uh, I think it was the 2016 or, or 15 State of the Union. This was under the Obama administration, but it had started several years earlier than that uh, under Dr. Francis Collins, really um, on the heels of the Human Genome Project. 
So the Precision Medicine Initiative is a bold, uh, you know, another audacious, we, we have a lot of these, um, another uh, bold uh, initiative to enroll a million or more people living all across the United States to be able to capture multimodal data, enter into a database and really accelerate the research that's done across the, the country in a diverse audience. And one of the things that was necessary to make sure that that was the case to um, make sure that we were um, getting a diverse participant population was really getting outside of the traditional academic medical centers. There were a lot of folks involved in the Precision Medicine Initiative that were traditional academic medical centers recruiting their patient population. But how do we make sure that anyone anywhere can raise their hand and complete the entire protocol so that we can um, make sure that it's reflecting the diversity of our country? And that's where Scripps was brought in. We received a $200 million NIH grant to run uh, the Participant Center for the All of Us Research Program. And this is where I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Julia to really talk about our work. She is the director of the Participant Center and leads both the digital health technology integration into the program, um, as well as the direct volunteer portion um, and the innovation arm of the, the program. So Julia, I'll turn it over to you for that. So I'll start by talking about how I got here to Scripps working on the All of Us Research Program. Um, I started with my education and research training at Memorial Sloan Kettering and Cornell University. And what I was thinking about as I was ending my educational uh, experience was how much time researchers spend on infrastructure and operations rather than the work that they really love doing, like thinking about hard problems and analyzing data. And so I thought that I could really um, you know, make a difference in those areas, focusing on research, research infrastructure and operations in addition to the research itself. So I did some work at New York Genome Center and Rockefeller University on those infrastructure and operations challenges and was really excited for the opportunity to come here to Scripps to continue that sort of work. And so, um, you know, Katie talked a bit about the All of Us Research Program, and I want to tell you a few of the things that I really love about it, which are you know, first that it's so inclusive that we're making sure that the participants in the program are reflecting the rich diversity of the United States. Second, that the data that we're collecting is very broad where we're trying to get a holistic view of individual's health and also look longitudinally so that we can see how people's health changes over time and try to learn about how we can help keep people healthy. And then finally, we're democratizing access to data where we're trying to get, you know, all of the data ready so that researchers can come to it and just ask their questions as quickly as possible to really accelerate the pace of discovery across many different diseases, as we'll talk more about as I go more into information about the program. So as Katie mentioned, our role in the All of Us Research Program is a participant center where we're making it as easy as possible for interested individuals anywhere in the US to join and remain enthusiastic participants. And we've continued this participant centric approach in partnership with so many different partners because reaching everyone across the US requires a lot of help. Um, so we have different partners that do outreach for us, that help collect biosamples, that help with the digital portion of the participant experience. And we really rely on this whole community of partners to be able to pull off all these audacious things. And so when we've thought about enabling participation by anyone anywhere, we've taken care to re-engineer the participant experience around the participant. You know, Katie mentioned how traditionally academic medical centers, you know, do most of the recruitment and engagement of participants in person, but we've wanted to expand access to these studies and make it so that people can participate from where they are. So that starts with just learning about the study and being able to join online wherever you are. And then even sharing data like surveys, electronic health records, digital health technology data can all be shared from wherever the person is. And they can also visualize data about themselves within the participant experience. One piece that is more challenging to do remotely is share biosamples, where there are some things about health and biology that we can really only learn by collecting a biosample. We are able to share um, saliva samples at home, just like the 23andMe's of the world um, do. And we try to make um, in-person blood and urine collection as accessible as possible by working with partners like Quest, who has over 2,000 sites nationwide, and local blood banks, including San Diego Blood Bank here locally, where folks who are already going in for a blood donation can also share samples for the All of Us Research Program. 
And just because most of the experience is digital and not in person, doesn't mean you can't connect with humans. So we make sure that there is a support center available where real humans answer the phone or email or chats by the web in English or Spanish based on the individual's language preference to answer any questions that folks have and provide any support that they need throughout the participant experience. So this is just sort of the beginning phases here where we're beginning to collect information and get people enrolled. But one of the key um, aspects here is a longitudinal data collection that we mentioned. So we really wanna keep people closely involved to sustain a 10 year relationship, which is hard to do even in person um, at times. So one of the ways that we aim to do this is by returning value every time a participant provides something of value to the program. And we also believe that a personalized medicine personalized medicine program should include personalized engagement. So here on the right is one schematic of how this could look where starting at the top, individuals contribute data and samples, and then we share updates on research with them. Research that's happening within the program, but also research happening other places that we think might be of interest. There are invitations to sub-studies, for example, where you could receive a Fitbit at no cost. And then we return personalized health information like genetic results, whether they could be based on um, you know, diseases you might be predisposed to or your ancestry, different things that we can learn about you based on the information that you provide to the program. And then we invite individuals to share more. So we aim to have this sort of positive feedback loop throughout the 10-year engagement process to have a mutually beneficial relationship. We also mentioned a bit about our innovation efforts. So we are working to innovate throughout the participant journey. You know, Even though we started on this earlier than many other research institutes, there's so much more to learn about how to particularly have longitudinal engagement. So we're focusing on different innovation initiatives for enrollment, You know, helping people learn about the study, engagement and retention, as we talked about on the previous slide, biosample collection, making it even more um, convenient and diversifying the type of biosamples that we can provide, and then adding to the data sets with sensors, electronic health records, and all different types of data that we can be able to collect to just make the data set more unique and more uh, valuable for research. So in terms of the goal of recruited, recruiting a million individuals, we're well on our way with over 400,000 participants, hundreds of thousands of whom have shared biosamples and electronic health records. And there are already over 900 research studies going on using this data. And those studies span many, many different diseases where any um, researcher that applies and um, gains access to the data through a, a rigorous application process can study whatever disease they're interested in and find it you know, in these hundreds of thousands of electronic health records and survey responses and such to be able to power their research questions. We've also um, made great progress on our goals to represent historically underrepresented communities with over 50% of participants coming from racial and ethnic groups that have been historically underrepresented in medical research and over 80% of participants coming from any group that's been historically underrepresented, which additionally includes things like individuals with low socioeconomic status, sexual and gender minorities, uh, rural individuals who just haven't had the opportunity to participate in the past. And we just wanted to show with these graphs just how underrepresented both Black and African American and Hispanic Latino communities have been in clinical trials in the past, and how in the All of Us Research Program, we're much closer to representing these groups, closer to um, you know, their representation within the US Census population. So we think this is absolutely critical, and we're really happy with how this has gone so far. One other way that we make sure to incorporate um, inclusive efforts in our program is by consulting a group of 20 advisors all across the country from all different backgrounds who weigh in on everything that we do in the participant experience. And this is just a photo of one of the uh, Zoom meetings that they had recently, which is the way we all meet now. Um, but we are so grateful to these folks for weighing in on everything and helping us see perspectives that we just wouldn't see when we're you know, too close to the work ourselves. It's so important to get their input. And so for anyone that's interested in learning more about the program and potentially participating, the website to go to is go.joinallofus.org. And then I'll hand it back to Katie to talk more about how we've built on this infrastructure for additional studies at the Digital Trial Center. Thanks, Julian. And I'm glad we have a picture of our amazing uh, virtual advisory team. It always puts a smile on my face um, every time we interact with them. Um, yeah, so we have been working over the last several years with the NIH's All of Us Research Program, um, and built these capabilities based on our early findings. And now really just in a short amount of time, the capabilities have really transformed. So 
Flash forward over to uh, 2020, this study progress uh, run by uh, Dr. Ed Ramos in our group really showcases the deep data capture that we can get in the home now. So this is a study of 1,000 people, uh, 500 with type 2 diabetes, 500 without, and we're really capturing so much stuff. So when we talk about the early step back in M-STOPs and what we could possibly um, capture, it was just, you know, you email people, they get one device. This one goes so much further than that. Julia talked about how hard it is to capture a biosample in the home, but things are really progressing there. So we are able now with our progress participants to send out a tap device, a touch activated phlebotomy device, where they actually stick it on the top of their arm with a press of a button, we get the blood necessary for HbA1c. We have newer um, partners in the stool sample space. Uh, we are studying microbiome, so they get blood, um, saliva, and uh, stool sample for the microbiome. And we have a, we've tested all of these things. Our poor team has tested all of these things out, but now we have a, a new microbiome capture where it is just a wipe that dissolves within the, um, the solution as it's on its way to the lab. So not quite there with the magic of it, but I think we are getting closer and closer to a magical experience, drawing your own blood and having these things um, really just direct to participants in the home, anywhere in the country um, or, or our territories. So where maybe people might find these things a little bit more magical though is, um, is everything else that you do during the study period this time. So not only do you collect all of your biosamples at home, what you also do is you, um, you get a continuous glucose monitor in the home, which you're guided by one of our study coordinators to put on. Then you get a Fitbit Sense sent to you out in the mail, and then you capture um, all of your nutritional intake over a course of 10 days with a photo capture that is um, empowered by AI. And then you're really able to see in real time what, um, you know, what is correlated in terms of, you know, when I eat something like a bag of Doritos, um, that's what I did in my dry run. I was eating things like Doritos that made my uh, blood glucose spike. And, and those are really things where we are creating some sort of value for, for our participants. They're seeing in real time the stuff that we see, and then we're going to return all of that information back to them. So it really is a deep data capture. In addition to that, with the infrastructure that we've been building with our, our partners, um, we have unprecedented speed and scale. So this is one that, you know, uh, front row lecture participants may have seen that Dr. Jennifer Radin uh, and Dr. Topol present on a while back, but this was at the very start of the pandemic. So I wanna just highlight the speed at which we can really get to scale with biomedical research. So we had a couple of papers that came out early on in 2020 that looked at um, activity data that you can get from your smartphone or activity tracker, resting heart rate, sleep activity, um, and how when we see a rise in resting heart rate, um, it might be an indicator that you're coming down with a viral illness. So um, just for those of you who haven't seen um, our previous lectures on that, Typically your resting heart rate normal across the, the whole population can range anywhere from like 50 beats per minute to hundred beats per minute, but your individual resting heart rate doesn't vary very much outside of like three beats per minute week to week. And so when we see deviations from that, it can mean that you're coming on with, coming uh, up with a, a, you're coming down with a viral illness. So we were able to do this. Uh, we wanted to know, is this gonna work for COVID? So we came together with amazing partnerships with. Walgreens, Fitbit, CVS, Attain, there are others, Garmin, Withings, WebMD, several partners that came on board to help us go from concept to nationwide launch in four weeks, and then really spread the word across the country. And we were, to able, we were able to quickly enroll uh, tens of thousands of individuals, and then we were able to capture that data over the course of the several, you know, over the first year of the pandemic. And the first paper came out I believe it was seven months from when we launched um, the first algorithm that looked at detecting COVID using wearable device data. And we've had several publications that have followed suit. Um, also, I think our, our team, um, again, led by Dr. Uh, Jennifer Radin and Giorgio Quare, um, has led to several collaborations across the globe. Um, so really looking at transforming the way that we're able to use digital health technologies to help us understand more about COVID, both the detection of the disease, the progression of the disease, vaccine response. So many, many um, 
research projects have followed, most recently one from our um, collaborators out in Germany who have replicated our most recent study. Um, on the next uh, slide, um, this one was, uh, again, Dr. Jennifer Radin published in JAMA Open over the summer, but really looked at, you know, some, um, some things within the data. Again, we, we launched this to see if we could detect early on at a population level where we were starting to get hotspots, but it also gave us an interesting opportunity to really take a deep dive into individuals' physiological response to getting COVID. So we had about 300 participants, 280, uh, something like that, um, who tested positive for COVID. And we looked at their changes in resting heart rate over time. They went up um, at the beginning of the disease, then they went down and we expected it to go back to baseline after it was elevated for a while. And where we didn't see that it, for, um, for a subset of the individuals, their resting heart rate remained elevated for several months. For others, for the majority, um, it remained elevated for weeks. So we started thinking, you know, maybe some of these subgroups, um, it might be those who are struggling with long COVID. Um, so we are doing a deeper dive into long COVID work. It's going to be um, piggybacking off of our uh, original COVID studies with Detect in this long COVID. I'm going to turn it over to Julia, who's leading some of our newer efforts around the long COVID wearable studies um, and her efforts as both a lead researcher and um, a patient in this patient population. So uh, Julia, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. I'm really excited to tell you about the long COVID wearable study, which is our effort to help patients with long COVID better manage their symptoms. So just to start, uh, we wanted to talk about the scale and scope of long COVID. So in terms of scale, it's estimated that over 17 million individuals in the US have long COVID and over 70 million worldwide. And unfortunately, the numbers are just growing every day as there are more and more cases, um, you know, particularly disappointing right now with Omicron, how many cases there are. In terms of the scope of long COVID, essentially what happens is people never recover from their, their COVID-19 infection. You know, most people recover after two weeks, but a significant number don't. And they can have any mix of over 200 symptoms affecting 10 different organ systems. In terms of the, um, the severity of this, 22% of individuals with long COVID are unable to work, and an additional 45% are able to work, but only at a reduced capacity. So this is a really disabling disease that is affecting a very large number of people. Based on you know, not being able to receive the support that they need in the medical community, a lot of long COVID patients are turning to each other. And there are many different groups, just a few of which are noted here. The ones that we've collaborated with that this study really came out of are um, the Body Politic COVID-19 support group and the patient-led research collaborative, which is their research arm. So as Katie mentioned, I'm a, start struggling with long COVID myself. I have them for about a year and a half. And the most helpful thing that I learned about living with long COVID actually came from other patients and is the basis for this study. So I had this mystery for myself that I was finding every Monday morning, I was waking up with the worst symptoms of the week. And it was very repli replicated that every Monday was the worst and I couldn't figure out why. And so what I learned from some research from patient led was that it's probably post-exertional malaise. So what this is, is where you overdo it in terms of physical or mental exertion. And while some patients feel the effects immediately, most people don't feel the effects until a day later. And for me, it was actually usually, usually two days later. So I was having, you know, whatever I was doing on Saturday, the effects were hitting me on Monday. And so it's very hard to figure out where that threshold is given that delay between when you do the activity and when you suffer the consequences. And the way these consequences are, you just go barely over your activity threshold and you feel the effects for a few days, which is um, the most common duration of post-exertional malaise among long COVID participants. So we wanna figure out how can we avoid this post-exertional malaise or relapse, a lot of people call it, where their symptoms just get much worse for a few days. So the way to do it is through pacing. And I thought I was pacing because I was doing so much less activity than I was doing pre-COVID, but it actually wasn't enough for what I needed. And so the way that I was able to solve this was using a wrist-worn wearable based on the advice of other long COVID patients. So this is um, you know, some of my own data here where I have this Garmin device where the main feature that I use is called body battery. It takes into account your sleep, 
your activity levels, your heart rate, and your stress, and puts it all together in one easy to comprehend score from zero to 100, which is analogous to how your cell phone uh, battery goes from zero to 100. So what it allows many long COVID patients to do, myself included, is see when their body battery is getting low and stop their activity and you know continue to pace so that they can avoid that relapse or post-exertional malaise days later. And so basically you can see the body battery going down before you feel the effects of it. And so that's what we really aim to do in this study is teach participants how to use wearable devices to pace and see if we can lessen the severity of their symptoms. So the overall hypothesis is that by giving individuals a Garmin device and advice about how to use it to pace, that we can help participants have fewer relapses and if they do have relapses, have them be less severe and possibly even recover from long COVID. There are a number of folks who have actually been able to pace their way out of the disease uh, as a whole. So where we're at right now is we've um, gotten input from the patient community by sending devices and the educational materials to a number of folks who have long COVID. And we asked them you know, for their advice about how we could improve the study. I was very impressed and surprised, pleasantly surprised to see that 86% of the individuals found the study was helpful for their symptom management. And of those who had a relapse, 83% said that the study reduced the severity and or duration of their, uh, of their relapse. And we have a few quotes from some of our user testers here, but you know, for me, this was more than I expected. I hope that we could help maybe half of patients um, to be able to reduce the severity of their symptoms, but for it to be the large majority is really exciting. And um, I'll just read to you one of these three quotes where Heather Elizabeth said that the study helped empower her to care for herself in a more proactive way. And that's really you know, what we wanna do in this study and with our digital trial center studies in general is help people to be more proactive about their health. So where we're at right now is we're working to secure study funding and then be able to start enrollment. We have um, a few wonderful collaborators here who are contributing some in-kind resources, but we need additional funding to be able to get this 100% off the ground. And right now, what you can do to learn more and sign up for updates is go to our website at longcovid.scripts.edu. And then I'll hand it back to Katie to talk more about the whole portfolio of digital trial center studies. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, so we have several going on. So you've heard about a lot today. So you've heard about um, the All of Us Research Program, our long COVID work, and Detect. We have several other research platforms going on. Um, and really what we've done, also I want to talk a little bit about the scalable model. So the other thing that the work with Detect really taught us is, wow, we can really engage tens of thousands of participants, hopefully eventually hundreds of thousands of participants, on some of our platforms, really by making it um, easy, making it transparent, and making it, you know, so that a lot of people can really contribute to kind of a baseline foundational study. So Detect was meant to be lightweight. It was meant to be mostly passive, where we're mostly collecting wearable device data. And then we prompt you only when you have symptoms, when you have a new vaccine to report, or when you have a new COVID-19 test to result. And then we, we communicate with our, our participants about once a month, um, which is news and updates. But what we can do now that we have such a wonderful patient population is we can go in and we can do layered targeted sub-studies. So like the long COVID test or another that we have going on with our collaborators over at Janssen Pharmaceuticals, looking at, can we take those algorithms? Can we trigger somebody um, when they might be getting sick to take an at-home COVID test, which tests for COVID and RSV and others? We have another sub-study going on with acoustic signaling for people who are at higher risk for some respiratory illness. So it's really enabled us to understand a new scalable model where we can continue to add on and go deeper and deeper um, off of these lightweight foundational protocols that we're developing um, within the My Data Helps platform, which is the platform by Care Evolution that we use. If you go to the next slide, this gives you a snapshot of everything we currently have live and recruiting under the Digital Trial Center. So of course we have Detect. Um, anybody who wants to get involved who has a wearable device data, definitely you can download 
um, the, the app and start contributing right away and, and getting some information back. Hopefully we have progress that I discussed. Um, we have refresh coming up, which is a sleep study, sleep and mental health um, that we're adding on. And that's going to be our latest and greatest. That's going to launch the first couple of weeks of January. We have the all of us research program. And the other one I want to highlight, um, I didn't skip over it. I, I meant to do it on purpose so that I could really highlight our power mom study. Um, we are in a maternal health crisis with um, maternal mortality in this country being the worst of any developed country. Um, it disproportionately affects Black and Hispanic, Asian, and Native American groups. And so we just launched the foundational protocol for the Power Mom study. And we have a consortium, again, just like we did with Detect. We have probably, I think, 10 or 12 different partners, including Microsoft, March of Dimes, several community partners, Share Care, Care Evolution, and others who are really coming together to help empower a research platform that will help us address research gaps in the maternal health space. So that is one that um, we're really looking forward to getting off the ground this year and a big area of focus for us as is sort of one of our next passion projects along with COVID and long COVID. So we'd love anybody to, to get involved. Um, there's a couple of ways we can do it. Like I said, anything that you uh, want to do, you can participate. Most of these are open. Some of them are on a wait list already. Um, see, we're making it magical. Uh, pe people are eager to get involved. So we have a wait listed on a couple and some are open. Um, to the general uh, public, and then some are open to, you know, eligible participants like the Power Mom study. We are always looking for, um, you know, uh, wonderful donors, um, like, a, a, you know, so many of you have done in the past. And then we're looking for collaborators, too. We're, we're a small group of about 40 people, uh, 50, 60, I don't know, we're growing. It's hard to keep track in the COVID days. Um, but we are looking for research collaborators too, who um, are mission aligned and who want to contribute to the research. So would encourage you to, um, you know, get in touch with our group. If we can go to the next slide, speaking of our amazing group that can talk for hours and hours on these things. This is just a few um, of our, our team members that work hard on these studies every single day. Um, and then the next slide highlights some of our, our wonderful collaborators and partners um, whom with we can't do uh, this work without. So Jamie, I promised we would not go over um, 40 minutes. So we would leave a full 20 minutes for Q&A. And I think we managed to get it right on the dot. So I will um, turn it back over to you to open up the, the Q&A. Hey, okay, terrific. Thanks very much. Uh, we, ha we have a lot of questions. I think, um, I think let me... Um, let me kind of aggregate one of them, which is there. Uh, people ask in various different ways, but you know, how do you handle data privacy? And you know, people uh, you know need to keep their DNA confidential, their health records confidential. They don't want to have you selling their stuff. So, so I, I'm I'm confident you have a great answer for this. But I think it's it's it was a major question that came up in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I can start and then Julia can help fill in the gaps. Uh, so we, uh, for our back end, for all of our studies, we use um, one of our partners, uh, Care Evolution. Um, they, they were found by us, basically. Uh, they weren't found by us or discovered by us, but we were introduced to them through our work with the All of Us Research Program. So they have gone through all of the backend security requirements that are necessary to run uh, studies over at the National Institutes of Health. They continue to go through all of the, the security protocols that we, we need to. So that's, that's something that's really important to us. For the studies, we remove all personal identifiers um, before research is done on any of our databases. And Julie can um, you know, fill in all of the details because she spends a lot of her time making sure that, that the data is private and secure. Yeah, I can definitely speak to that. So we, you know, remove obvious identifiers from all information before it's made available for research, things like your birthday or your name or your address. Um, we make sure that when researchers access the data, it's done within a very secure environment. And we also have very rigorous privacy standards for any partners that we operate with who are housing data so that we make sure that you know, it, it's secure as it can possibly be. Of course, nothing is 100%. And we know there are breaches, you know, that unfortunately happen all the time, but we absolutely do everything within our power. 
Um, a couple other things for the All of Us Research Program. One is that you know we know there are hundreds of individuals um, analyzing the data, and there are concerns about what might happen with it. So it actually is only accessible in a cloud environment, so that folks can't download it and then try to sell it to someone else. You have to access it there, and so that we know who's accessing it and why. Um, the researchers always also have to agree not to try to re-identify someone as part of their agreement to access the data. So they can't try to put together little bits and pieces about someone that they know to try to figure out who it is. And if, you know, if it's found out that you're doing that, you'll be banned from the resource. Um, so there are a lot of different layers of protection. And, you know, the reason we spend so much time on that is because we know we're nothing if we don't have the, the data that people generously provide to us. And so we do everything that we can to keep it safe. Yeah, and I just did see something come up on the chat, so I'll just take this last one that's related to that, is no, we do not um, have to um, open up the database to um, um, investigators. So we have a certificate of confidentiality, which means all researchers at the All of Us Research Program and including the work that we do at the center um, do not need to um, open that up. And you're you're talking about um, for law enforcement purposes. For law enforcement coming purposes. in, yeah. yeah. Okay, yep. yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. So uh, one of one of the questions that came up is, you know, what what are the new kinds of sensors that are going to be coming out, and you know, how how might you expand on on the kinds of data that you're able to gather? Julia, do you want to? Yeah, I can talk to it a little bit. I mean, so one of the things that's really exciting that Katie talked about a little bit is continuous glucose monitoring, which is, you know, particularly important for folks with diabetes. Instead of doing a finger prick, you can just have your your glucose being monitored all the time. But it's actually also been really fascinating for the folks in our group that don't have diabetes or maybe, you know, have a family history of diabetes to see what changes there are um, in their blood sugar triggered by different foods. And it's also been amazing how personalized it is where, you know, maybe for Katie, it's Doritos. For another person on our team, it was pancakes. For someone else, it's oatmeal, which, you know, you would think oatmeal would be fine. So it's that one's been really fascinating. Um, the one that Katie mentioned in M-STOPs is really interesting too, in terms of looking at different um, types of ways that your heart rhythm can go wrong. Um, you know, and, and another thing that we're really excited about is using the devices that folks already have, the way that's been done in Detect, and seeing what more we can learn from the data that's there, um, you know, particularly with things like heart rate variability, which is the slight difference in time between your heartbeats and what we can learn from that. So there's endless different ways, I think, that we can use this data um, to be able to learn about health and help people be more proactive. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add there, Katie, feel free. No, I will just say that, um, you know, one of the lovely benefits of working with uh, Eric Topol is we get every single new sensor and uh, device sent mm -hmm. to our office. So when we are in the office, we have just piles and piles of new sensors and, and new things coming out. And that's, um, that's great to be able to collaborate. It is changing on a daily basis. What we can do with, with devices that people already have is amazing, like Julia said. And then there are other novel sensors constantly being developed, you know, on voice detection, tone, uh, gait. I mean, you name it, and, and they're starting to discover not all of them will, will sort of make it into, into usable, um, you know, useful clinical space. But but a lot of them will. So we encourage you if, if you are on the line and, and have one of those uh, novel sensors, um, we're, already, we're probably already working with you, but if we're not, uh, reach out for sure. Right, nice. So, uh, so people have asked a variety of this question in a variety of ways, but it, you know, it centers around getting access to, to devices. So, so you know, it sound, it, from the tone of the talk, it sounds like for most of the participants, you actually supply devices but, but they have to have a cell phone, right? Yeah, we do, we do a little bit of both. So, you know, to make this widely accessible and to get scale, we do rely a lot on a bring your own device. So a lot of our work with Detect um, and, and the continuing work on algorithms really make it possible to use any sort of sensor, whether it be a Fitbit, an Apple Watch, a Garmin, others, um, anything that you want to bring to the table. So we open up sort of a no data left behind sort of policy within our, our studies where anything that you have that you already own and is connected to your smartwatch um, 
or I'm sorry, your smartphone via um, Apple Health or Google Fit, we can ingest these data. For certain of our studies, um, we do supply devices and for people who um, may be underserved or underrepresented or have a reason to get a device, we try and um, make sure that devices are available for those who need them. And then uh, for, the, for the stuff that we, we have particular um, you know, data capture needs, we send out specific devices from the studies. Um, so let, let me ask a kind of a, a unrelated question. It seems like this would be amazing to combine with clinical trials for actual drugs. So is there anything going on in, in that area? Um, not yet, but we'd love to collaborate, Jamie, with the rest of, uh, you know, Caliber and groups. Uh, we, we have some, you know, um, it's on the roadmap for us, but, but that's not something that we started with. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Seems like, seems like a, a powerful direction to get. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, some of the stuff that we didn't touch on today, um, you know, that I think is making that possible is the ability to also connect electronic health records for right. participants in that patient mediated way. So a, a lot of the reason before that, you know, we were sort of tied into the academic medical centers, we needed longitudinal health records on folks, we needed to be able to dive into that. Now with the patient mediated smart on fire, and for those of you who don't know who that is, it's, it's the same way that Apple Health Records connects you to um, health records, but our technology enables it on iOS, Android, and mobile web. So about, it's close to 900 health systems now across the mm -hmm. country, and it continues to grow. Um, patients can go in, connect with their own electronic health records, get that data visualization back, and um, choose to share it with, with research studies that I think will enable a lot of the stuff in, in the more robust clinical trials that we're talking about. So there's, there's a couple of other kind of theme questions, One, um, which is if you're a participant, you know, what do you get back in terms of information about your data and how it relates to everybody else's data? And then there's another group of people that are just interested. Can we mine this data, you know, as independent researchers? And you know, so what's, what are the. Yeah. So Julia, do you want to start with what they get back from all of us? And then yeah. I can talk a little bit about what we get back from the other studies. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I'll also take the, where, how to get access to the data. I put the link in the responses, but it's researchallofus.org is where you can go apply for access to the All of Us data. So we definitely welcome and encourage anybody that's interested to do that. You can also see data snapshots there and, and get actually a decent amount of information about the data that's available to see if it would be appropriate for your study. Yep. And then in terms of data that you get back, you know, we are very passionate about making sure that participants get their data back. Particularly if we learn something important about you, we want to make sure that you have that information. So we're really excited about sharing genomic data, particularly. Mm -hmm. Right now, folks and all of us have access to ancestry data, traits data, which is sort of fun things like do you love or hate cilantro, um, you know, alcohol flush response that are genetic things that are sort of fun. But next year, we're really excited to return health related results. So these are things like um, you may have heard of BRCA1-2 variants, which can increase risk to certain types of cancer. And so these are really medically actionable results that are across 59 different genes that we'll be returning to folks next year. We, we expect about one to 3% of people will have a, a really actionable health result that is very meaningful for them. And we'll make sure that information is returned with a genetic counselor who can talk you through what it means for your health, what your next steps might be, how you might discuss that with your family because they may also have the, the same genetic variants. Um, another category of health results we'll be returning is um, pharmacogenomic results. So that means that you might process a medicine differently than someone else. And we expect that on average, everybody will have one of those where it's really important for you to know if either you need a higher dose because you know, you're, you're metabolizing it differently than someone else, or you might have a side effect that the general population wouldn't have. So, um, overall, we're very passionate about returning results. And that's just a few of the ones that we're doing in all of us. So, so here, uh, one, one of the listeners asked about chronic fatigue. So it yes. seems like long COVID is, is sort of a peculiar manifestation of this, but there's many people that suffer from chronic fatigue and, and there's, they're left to just manage it. And so would it be able to sort of add that population to your long COVID study? Yes. So we're thinking about that actively. Um, you know, I am so grateful to the MECFS community for everything that they've done. I mean, pacing basically came from them. Right. And so right. it's, you know, it's, 
absolutely critical to make sure that we're including them and in all of the, the benefit that we have in long COVID studies. And I would love to be able to include, um, include ME-CFS patients and just have that be part of the eligibility criteria. It's a great point. So, you know, something else that strikes me it's worth just discussing is, you know, you're kind of veering into the lane of, of, of providing medical advice. But, but you're not really, you're, you're just saying, here, here's the data, here's how you might modify your behavior. But, but at some point, you know, it really becomes almost you're being, a, you know, an ad hoc digital physician. And, and so, you know, what, what are the landmines there for, for this kind of work and what are the opportunities? Well, we, we try and stay away. Well, we do stay away from offering medical um, advice within any of our digital trial uh, center studies. That's important for us to make sure that, you know, we're, um, we're gathering the data, we're giving information back, but we're staying away from medical advice because we are not physicians, we're not clinicians. But um, we do want to make sure that we disseminate this knowledge pretty widely and quickly across, you know, the, the entire industry so that, you know, the algorithms that we're developing for detect that might show early onset of viral illness, we are putting that out there, open science, so that clinicians and other um, digital health technology companies can have access to that and utilize it and maybe able to use it in care um, faster than maybe um, it might otherwise happen. Yeah, I'll just add to that. We really encourage folks to talk about the things that they see in the study that is advice for them with their physicians so that they can really take into account the entire picture of their health, which we, you know, may not have in front of us when we're um, sharing advice. So I agree it's a very fine line that uh, we need to be careful about. So, th so there's a lot of people that want, that want to volunteer and sign up, and I want to make sure that we get people that information about how to participate. Uh, how are you going to get the last, you're, you're basically halfway there, how are you going to get the last half a million people, and, and what's the future of this program? I mean, it, it seems like it's terrific. Yeah, we're working hard to recruit more folks every day. You know, I think the the anyone anywhere approach, I think is gonna make a really significant contribution to that last half a million people. And, you know, what we hope is right now it's funded for 10 years from Congress, but we hope this becomes a multi-generational study in the end. Um, you know, many folks are probably familiar with the Framingham Heart Study, which is, you know, mostly folks in Framingham, Massachusetts and have been participating for generations. And we hope that all of us is like that, except inclusive of folks around the country and can really be a place to have, um, you know, not only passive research, but eventually uh, interventional studies, like you had mentioned, Jamie, where different um, investigators can come in with a, a trial, select participants based on their known medical conditions, invite them to participate, and then folks have the opportunity to choose whether or not they want to join. So we really want it to be a, a major infrastructure to fuel all kinds of health research for our generations to come. Right. Yeah, and if people are interested in signing up today for uh, for all of us, it's go.joinallofus.org. Um, and if you want to sign up for Detect right away, that's the COVID one, looking at wearable device data. And you don't need a device. You can go ahead and sign up because there's sub-studies going on that distribute devices right now. Um, that's detect.scripts.edu. If you happen to be pregnant or know somebody who's pregnant, powermom.scripts.edu. And um, yeah, we we definitely want you know the word to get out there. We encourage as much participation as possible. And like I said, if people want to collaborate in other ways, uh, they can um, contact us, or or if they just want to talk. Like I mean, I'll go back to you know for detect. I think you know we have partnerships with librarians in Alaska. We have partnerships with University of Guam. We have partnerships with American Osteopathic Foundation, like reaching out to rural doctors. So. Anybody who wants to help spread the word about this research or be involved, we, we welcome anybody anywhere um, to also not only participate, but, but come in as a collaborator and an ambassador for the program. Yeah, we'll also send out all those links afterwards, so just in case folks who weren't able to write them down real quick, um, we'll send them by email to make sure everybody has them yeah. for easy clicking. Yeah, we have been logging all the questions and we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. We gotta wrap up here in a minute. Um, uh, but we will uh, try to uh, pr provide uh, direct answers to uh, uh, other people that have specific questions. I, I note that we have one volunteer who signed up just during the Q&A. So mm -hmm. thanks, Abu. Thank They're you. all signed up. That's great. It's, uh, so uh, I, I, think, I think we should just wrap it up. But you know, I, I, 
I wonder, a couple of people have asked in different ways about the scalability of this. And I think, you know, my sense is that this was a vision uh, to try to see how can we engage a million people. So, and, and it seems like it's going incredibly well. So what, what does it look like to go to all of us as everyone in the country or even the world? How do we get there? I mean, this is, I think this is the way we do it, right? Um, through these different research programs, through the All of Us program, through the other ones that we're running out of scripts, is really making it easy, making it valuable for participants so that they have a reason to join, a reason to continue on with the researcher, and the collaborative nature of making sure that you know, it's just not one study run by Scripps Research over here, but it really is a collaboration with many researchers and a collaboration with the participants across the world that I think will enable that scale that, you know, we've wanted to see for a really long time. Okay. We would love if everyone in the U.S. joined all of our research Great. studies. We welcome as many people. One million is the goal, but that's a minimum. We'd love it to be 330 million. Okay, well, I think, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Again, we'll try to reach out. This uh, video will be, was recorded and will be available on YouTube. And uh, I, the, I believe the slides are also be available. Uh, yep. So if you want to share your enthusiasm with your friends, we encourage you all to do that. This is the last front row for this year. And uh, so we don't have the lineup set for next year, but we will be continuing front row. Uh, in January. So all of you are signed up and you will automatically get the update for what's next. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in 2022 in the front row. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you all.